Okay. Cool. Well, let's get started. Um, we're very excited to welcome back Alpesh Krishna, um, who was formerly an intern here and is now uh, giving us a, a, a grand job talk. Um, Alpesh is a fifth year PhD student at UMass Amherst, advised by uh, Mohit Iyer, um, and works is like an expert in long text generation, um, everything ranging from methods for long text generation, uh, conditional generation, um, decoding practices, evaluation practices, um, and um, previously, uh, Kalpesh has interned at various places such as Google, TTI Chicago, and most recently when Kalpesh interned here at AI2 uh, working on long text evaluation, um, his research was awarded an outstanding paper at EACL 2023, um, which we were very excited about. So. Um, yeah, really looking forward to this talk. And Kalpesh, you can. Oh, right before you take it away, I believe Kalpesh, uh, you will, will have two points in the talk for clarification questions, and then we'll take questions at the end if that works for everybody. Kalpesh, uh, you can't see the chat or the screen, or can you? Um, I can see just the Tahoma screen, and um, yeah, that's it. I may be able to see the chat if I press some buttons. But OK, I, I, let's not worry about that. So yeah, uh, if there's any chat, I'll moderate it. But I'll try to preserve everything uh, for these two checkpoints. Um, and with that, let's let Kalpesh take away. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Kyle, for the introduction. And hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here for my talk, Towards Robust Long-Form Text Generation Systems. I'm excited to share some of the research that I've done during my PhD and some future directions that I'm excited about. So before I begin, a small note. So since this presentation is about long form text generation, a number of slides contain long generated outputs. You do not need to read these outputs. I will highlight the relevant parts and explain it in my narration. So let's get started. So now we've all seen the success of chatbots like ChatGPT. It's literally all over the news channels. And it's the first time that AI ML tech is getting so much public interest from the media. This really begs the question, what makes these chatbots so fascinating? Well, first, you can ask it questions about anything, and it provides you with reasonable looking answers. These generations are not only grammatically correct, but they're also coherent. But one of the most interesting things is that the generations are long form and novel. And this is quite unlike any AI system before this. So in the age of these large language models, can we say that long form text generation is a solved problem? So let's try to see this by asking these models a question. Explain in context learning in GPT-3 in simple terms, which is this fascinating concept where language models can perform any new task with just a few example demonstrations in the prompt. And let's look at the outputs from chat GPT, instruct GPT, and OPT-175 billion for this input prompt. So on the surface, the outputs look really good. But if we look more closely, we can start seeing some critical errors. For instance, ChatGPT says that in-context learning requires fine-tuning the GPT-3 model, which is the exact opposite of what actually happens according to the original GPT-3 paper. On the other hand, InstructGPT is producing a lot of text which is completely irrelevant to the prompt. And more broadly, there are a number of errors present in these generated outputs. These issues are collectively known as hallucination issues. Now, in order to detect these errors and improve our systems, we need a way to evaluate these outputs. Unfortunately, long form text is really hard to evaluate. Because these answers are so long, it's really hard for human evaluators to, to assess them correctly. And there's a large output space with many possible correct answers to the same question. And this makes it really hard to develop suitable automatic metrics for this kind of evaluation. A third issue with these current language models is they're a bit like monoliths, and it's really hard to customize their outputs or control them. For instance, in this kind of output, we may want to do things like add scientific references, control the output length, make the text simpler to understand, or make it less speculative. However, Current language models do not provide us with any such sliders to make fine-grained adjustments to our outputs. Finally, the rise of these large language models have raised several concerns about misuse and privacy. For instance, there's a lot of worry that large language model outputs 
will be used by college students to cheat in essays. There's also a growing privacy risk about whether these models can generate the sentences that they were trained on verbatim during inference time. My research is broadly focused on these four issues in current text generation systems. In my research, I have focused on empirically identifying these issues in current models, as well as building new algorithms and techniques to help us make progress towards these issues. In this talk, I will primarily focus on three of these papers. I will first describe a system that we built for long form question answering, which achieved a state of the art performance on the official leaderboard at that time. However, despite this excellent performance, a careful empirical analysis of system outputs will reveal several issues related to the model as well as evaluation. The first issue that we will observe is that of off prompt hallucinations. I will then use that to describe our algorithm rank gen which is an attempt to, towards addressing this issue in long form text generation. Next, I will discuss issues in both automatic and human evaluation of long form text generation. And I will use that to then describe the long eval guidelines, which are three simple empirically motivated ways to improve the quality of human annotations. And finally, I will conclude with two future directions that I'm really excited about related to planning in long form text generation as well as secure long form text generation. So let's get started with the first part of the talk. So this is some work I did with Orko Roy at Google AI and my advisor, Professor Mohit Ayer, and it was published at NACL 2021. So before we begin with the actual content, what is long form question answering? So given an input, often an information seeking how or a why question, the goal of long form question answering is to produce a paragraph long abstractive answer to it, typically 250 to 400 words in length. For example, here's a question about jellyfish functioning without a brains or a nervous system, along with a 327 word answer to it. Note that this example is from the ELI5 data set, which was introduced in FAN et al. in 2019, and it will be the main focus of this work. An important aspect of this task is that we are operating in an open domain setting. That is, models must find supporting evidence from a large knowledge source, such as Wikipedia. And this is quite different from extractive question answering settings, like Squad, where a passage is available and it contains the answer word or phrase which can answer the particular question. So in other words, the model must look at a number of Wikipedia articles through retrieval or some other similar process and synthesize the information together for its final answer. So how do we build a system for this task? So at a high level, we adopt a two-stage retrieve and generate pipeline. So given a question in Wikipedia, we first pass them through a retriever that we built called Contrastive Realm. This gives us a number of Wikipedia articles which are relevant to the question. In this case, articles about boats, ships, and paint. Next, we concatenate all these retrieved documents together along with the question. And since this can become a pretty long sequence, we pass it through a long range language model called a routing transform model, which gives us a final output generation. We optimize both the retriever and the generator on the training set of ELI5, which is our long form QA data set. So getting into some details, let's discuss a retriever first. So given a question, we ideally want to map it to its corresponding paragraph from a knowledge source like Wikipedia. However, we do not have this gold data available to us in the ELI5 data set. However, what we do have access to is the actual gold answers to these questions, which are ELI5 paragraphs, but not Wikipedia paragraphs. But one nice thing is that they're paragraph long and stylistically similar to the Wikipedia articles. So we do this pro proxy objective where we map the question to the original answer and hope that this would generalize to Wikipedia paragraphs during inference. We start with a pre-trained neural retriever model called the REL model and train it with a contrastive learning objective using the equation shown here. Here Q represents question vectors, A represents answer vectors, and B is the mini batch size that we use. We use large mini batch sizes of 12,000 QA pairs to have a large set of negatives in the denominator. I will use a very similar objective while developing RankGen and then discuss this equation in a lot more detail. 
So moving on to the next part, our generative model. So since our inputs are a concatenation of several retrieved documents, they can get quite long and expensive to store in memory. As a result, we use a sparse attention model to attend over this long sequence of text. We use a routing transform model from Roy et al. 2020, which clusters similar tokens together for self-attention. This model supports a context window of 8,000 tokens, which is long enough for all our applications. Additionally, we pre-trained this model on documents from the Project Gutenberg 19 benchmark, which is a number of novels having words about 70k, uh, having about 70k words per story. This really encourages the model to generate long sequences of text before a final step of fine tuning on ELI5 data. So I'll now move on to some results. So we compare our model to several popular baselines, including the RAG model from Lewis et al. 2020 and BART plus GPR from Petroni et al. 2020. All these approaches have a similar number of trainable parameters. In terms of generative performance, we see that our system significantly outperforms prior work in terms of RUGEL, outperforming the RAG model by 9.1 RUGEL. If we combine the retrieval and the generative performance, we get a score of 2.4 kiltarel, which at that time was a state of the art on the official ELI5 leaderboard. So qualitatively, our generations look long and coherent, such as this one. Um, here's the output to a question, how do shampoos and conditioners work? And in this case, we can see that the model retrieved articles about shampoo, hair, and dandruff, and generated this, this long and coherent looking answer. However, if we inspect this answer more closely, we, we will see something very strange. For instance, this answer says that shampoos contain hydrogen peroxide. But this is not mentioned anywhere in the Wikipedia article of shampoos, as you can see on the right side here. I also confirmed this fact from a professional dermatologist, and he said that this is not true. More generally, there are a number of facts in this answer not present anywhere in any of the retrieved documents. And while we trained a model to use retrievals, what it's actually doing is, is using the knowledge that it learned during training. This knowledge is stored in the weights of the neural network, and there's an inherent tension for a model whether it should trust its own knowledge or use a knowledge in a retrieved article. And in this case, it seems to be preferring the knowledge in, in its weights rather than the retrieved articles. To empirically verify this observation with a number of uh, examples, we conducted a simple experiment. Originally, we were feeding the retrieved documents output from our retriever before generation. But instead, we simply replaced these retrieved documents with completely random documents from the retrieval corpus. These random documents, such as articles on lions, USA, and pasta, have nothing to do with the original question on shampoo. We then measure the performance of the generative quality of the trained model after conditioning on each of these two different retrieval sets. And we use both automatic metrics like RUGEL as well as a human evaluation. Very surprisingly, the RUGEL is almost identical between these two settings. We even asked humans which outputs they preferred. And surprisingly, they slightly preferred outputs from the model which conditioned over random retrievals rather than predicted retrievals. In other words, the CREL model was not needed at all during inference, despite all our excessive training. And our long-form QA system is not strongly conditioning on the input. It's hallucinating text from its parametric knowledge. So with that hurdle in mind, I will move on to the next part of the talk. Uh, before I move on, uh, I'll just pause if anyone has clarification questions on the first part. OK, so um, I'll just keep moving then. So yeah, I will now move on to the next part of the talk, where I'll present RankGen which is an algorithm to encourage language models to adhere to the input prompt more often. And after I complete RankGen, I will revisit our work in long-form question answering to discuss some broader challenges with evaluation and how we can address them. So RankGen is some work I did with Yape Chang and Mohit from UMass, as well as John Whiting from Google AI. So in the previous part of the talk, we noticed that our long-form QA system 
often drifts away from the retrieval set of providers input to the model. However, this off prompt drifting is a problem in much larger and newer language models as well. If you'll recollect, in the very first example I showed in this presentation, Instruct GPT and OPT were excessively off topic. And they often miss critical information about the prompt, as highlighted in blue here. We will now try to quantify this problem in large language models using a suffix identification test that we designed, and then use that to motivate Rangchen. So consider the story called Peter Pan from the Project Gutenberg 19 benchmark. First, we will highlight a long span of text from this book. This is highlighted in green here and shown on the left side of the screen. And this is roughly 250 words in length and ends in a sentence boundary. We call this span of text a prefix. Next, we will select two more long spans. First, the span immediately after the prefix, highlighted in blue here and called the gold suffix. And second, a similar length span from a different part of the same document, highlighted in red here and called the random suffix. We then ask language models to do suffix identification. Given a prefix, how often do language models prefer the gold suffix over a random suffix from the same book? In other words, how often is the probability of the gold suffix given the prefix higher than the probability of a random suffix given the prefix? We test several language models on this task, including random guessing, GPT-2 Excel, GPT-3 175 billion, as well as an upper bound human performance. So moving on to some results. On books in Project Gutenberg 19 or PG-19, we see that language models far underperform humans, with GPT-2 Excel getting just 72.3% versus humans who get 94.5%. This performance is even worse on Wikipedia. GPT-3 is getting just 67.7%, whereas humans continue to score high and get 91%. Now, if instead of these random negatives, we choose some hard negatives using some heuristics, so we don't sample a random, random span in red, but just, just use some heuristics to span to, to sample a random span with, with some um, to make it a bit harder, we can see that GPT-2 Excel does almost as good as guessing, getting like 50.7% on Wikipedia. And humans are still doing really well. Humans are getting 90.5% on the Wikipedia split of this. You may be wondering why these negatives are being preferred. We hypothesize this is because of two reasons. First, these negatives have high likelihood in isolation. So they have a number of common words or words that were seen often during training, which boosts the likelihood in isolation. Or second, these language models are ignoring the prefix which is longer term context in favor of more local context in order to do next one word prediction. And this has also been shown by some prior works uh, linked here. So how can we fix this issue of poor conditioning on the inputs? There could be three high level ways to do this. A first school of thought is that scale is all we need. And perhaps we just need to train a much bigger model or according to the chinchilla laws, just train it on a lot more data and we'll just be or we'll be all fine. Or second, we need a better training objective to better align our models towards these goals. Or third, we have not yet found the right decoding strategy during inference, and our language models are trained perfectly. So in this talk, I'll present a new algorithm for text generation, which we call Rang Chen, and it lies somewhere between the second and the third school of thought. At a high level, you can think of rank gen as a self-supervised training objective to encourage language models to use their prefix more often. So consider a number of prefixes from a book, such as Peter Pan, all highlighted in green here and on the left side of the screen. And then consider the corresponding suffixes. So the suffix that immediately follows this particular prefix, highlighted in blue here and shown on the right side. We pass each of these prefixes and suffixes through a large encoder language model, in this case, T5 3 billion, to get a vector representation for the prefixes and the suffixes. 
We then encourage the prefix vector to be close to its corresponding suffix vector or a positive pair. But we push the prefix vector to be away from all the other suffix vectors in the same mini batch or a negative pair. This is trained using large scale contrastive learning, a method that has been used to learn strong image and multimodal representations. And it was also used in the CRM training process discussed earlier. An important point to emphasize here is that all our prefixes and suffixes in a particular mini batch belong to the same document. So all these paragraphs highlighted here are from Peter Pan and different mini batches would have different books. This is really important because it encourages our model to contrast between correct as well as incorrect continuations, which have topical similarity. More formally, let P be a prefix and S be a suffix and B be a mini batch of prefix suffix pairs from the same book. We first encode them uh, using a neural encoder or T, which is T53 billion in our case, and take the vector representation of the first token, which is a special token that we add, uh, add into the input. We then estimate the probability of a suffix given the prefix, measuring the vector similarity between the prefix vector and each of the suffix vectors, and then doing a final step of softmax. The numerator here has a positive pair, while the denominator has both the positive as well as all the negative pairs. Finally, we will use a cross entropy loss function to maximize this probability. Like I mentioned before, the batch size is a very important hyperparameter here, as it determines the number of negatives in the denominator. And we'll use very large mini batch sizes with range and base having 4096 prefix suffix pairs, as well as range and Excel having 1.5k um, prefix suffix pairs. In order to further boost this set of negatives, we, we expand this and also consider some additional hard negatives. We take our prefixes and sample several generations from a causal large language model, which are represented in G by G here. And then we encode them in a similar manner to the suffix to get a vector representation for these generations. We then augment our denominator, which contains a set of negatives to also include the generated negatives and contrast between the positive pair as well as the generated negatives. So moving back to our triangle of possible solutions, one way to think of rank gen is a K word language modeling objective instead of a next one word language modeling objective as they're modeling the probability distribution over suffixes given a prefix. So how do we actually generate text with rank gen? We have two strategies for this. The first is to over-generate and re-rank. So given a prefix, we first pass it through any pre-trained causal language model, like GPT-2XL, which gives us a number of candidate continuations. We pass each of these continuations through the suffix branch of rank gen to get a suffix vector representation for each of these candidates. In a very similar manner, we also encode the prefix, passing it to the prefix branch of rank gen to get a vector representation for the prefix. And we then measure the dot product similarity between the prefix and each of the suffix vectors to get a score for every generation. The maximum scoring generation is then chosen as our final output. Now, this could also be incorporated in a beam search like setup. So here, instead of generating the entire sequence at once, we generate a shorter span, say 10 tokens or 20 tokens. And instead of taking just a top one candidate, we will take the top beam size candidates. So in this case, the beam size is two. So we'll take the top two candidates. We'll discard all the other candidates and then concatenate them to the prefix for another round of generation. So once again, encode the prefix and the candidates with rank gen, um, sorry, pass them through, a, through the language model and then encode the candidates as well as the prefix to rank gen, get scores for each of the candidates and then to choose the top beam size candidates to continue another round of generation. In terms of our triangle of possibilities, one way to think of rank gen is, a, is that it's a learned decoding strategy where we are scoring outputs using a deep network 
rather than completely relying on a single decoding strategy like nucleus sampling or top case sampling. So I'll now move on to some ex to our experimental setup. In our experiments, we decoded text from four causal language models and considered language models having size 300 million parameters to 11 billion parameters, including fine-tuned T5XXL models. Our largest rank gen had 1.2 billion parameters. So we are testing models both bigger as well as smaller than rank gen to see whether it generalizes across sizes. For automatic evaluation, we use a MOV metric which measures the similarity of the distribution between machine generated text and human written text. In the paper that introduced MOV, they showed that MOV has high correlation with human judgments. And that's why we will use it for all our automatic evaluation. So we compare Rangent to several other decoding alternatives like greedy decoding, ancestor sampling, nucleus sampling, typical and top case sampling. We find that greedy decoding just gets a MOV score of about 15.4 due to its repetitive nature. Whereas using truncated sampling methods like nucleus sampling boosts this to about 77 MOV. And this has also been shown by some prior work. However, using rank gen to re-rank 20 nucleus samples boosts this performance to 82.6 MOV with ancestor samples and 83.4 with nucleus samples. And finally, if we use beam search, we can improve this even further to 85.0 MOV. Now, after the release of Rank Gen, several other newer decoding strategies were introduced. Contrastive search, contrastive decoding, as well as ETA sampling, all of them roughly in October 2022. We re-ran Rank Gen and compared Rank Gen against all these newer decoding strategies. We found that Rank Gen continues to outperform all these newer methods, as shown in this table here. Our experiments so far mostly considered long form generation in an open ended setting. Now, what about some other text generation tasks? We also evaluated rank gen on text to code generation. So, which is basically given a natural language input, a model needs to generate Python code, which solves a particular instructions in the natural language input. We compared rank gen to the palm coder model, the 540 billion palm coder model as well as the Codex model or the Code Darwin C002 model. We see that augmenting Codex with rank gen significantly improves performance, improving performance by 3.4 pass at one on the OpenAI human eval benchmark. And both these numbers are significantly higher than the Palm Coder model, which get 36.0 pass at one. We also evaluated the rank gen encoder for non-generation tasks focusing on the literary evidence retrieval task from Thai et al. 2022. And we see that Rangjan outperforms several other popular retrievers like DPR, Colbert, and also the CRL model that we introduced earlier, getting 6.0 recall at one versus 2.9 for Colbert. And because human uh, automatic evaluation of text generation is limited, we also conducted a careful human evaluation, comparing Rangjan to nucleus sampling. In our initial experiments, we found that evaluation work with crowd workers was pretty unreliable. So we conducted the human evaluation, hiring English writers and teachers from Upwork after a lot of careful screening. Overall, we found that they preferred rank gen output 75% of the times over nucleus samples. We also asked them for a paragraph long explanation explaining why they preferred one output over the other. And this is what they said. They gave a number of nice reasons like it had more topical similarity, a topical relevance to the prefix. It had better continuity, flow, or chronology. It was also stylistically closer to the prefix uh, on several occasions. We made rank chain really simple to use, and we packaged it as a pip package. Simply run pip installed rank chain to install it. And with four, four more lines of code, you can generate with any of our strategies using any causal language model on Hugging Face. We're using the code shown here. Okay, so uh, with that, I will move on to the next part of the talk, but I'll pause just once again if anyone has any questions. So, Pesh, a very quick one. I was wondering uh, on your initial uh, benchmark, uh, the one where uh, you were asking to guess what uh, uh, the follow-up passage was um, truly a follow-up 
or um, uh, random or higher negative? How does rank gen perform on that? Um, it's, it's, it's close to human performance on that. I just had one quick follow up to that, which is, you know, I imagine when humans do this, they, they only look at the first few tokens to see does this sort of follow from the previous context. So how, how do you think GPT-3 would do if you only score the like the first 10 tokens, for instance, instead of like a 200 token kind of window? So it's actually worse if you just take the first 10 tokens. Um, so the, the, the reason for that is because our task breaks the prefix and suffix on a sentence boundary. So it, it's actually harder than just looking at the first three to four tokens because the syntactical structures do not continue across the across the two. So we actually benchmark different lengths of generation, and we found that as the generations get longer, the models are actually doing better, but 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 far uh, but far underperforming humans. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, Matt, so ask your question. Yeah, I have a quick question about um, like the computational overhead. Sorry, of um, of generating with this like what like how much does this add to your decoding time yeah so uh, so rank gen itself is um, very quick because it's um, it just requires an encoder feed uh, feed forward pass and it's very simple to parallelize that but the bottleneck is actually when you when we have to generate many sequences of text which is also an issue with um, with with methods like beam search where many possible continuations have to be generated like by beam search i mean vanilla beam search so um so uh, we we made two implementations of rank gen one was with hugging face and one was uh, one was using t5x which is a which is like a jax library on uh, for, for, for for large language models i think in hugging face the speed up, the it took about 5x time if we want to generate 20 candidates and for t5x the speed up was uh, the slowdown was about 3x Okay, so adding lots of time. <laughs> okay, oh, so sorry. Oh, sorry. You you can go ahead. I, I was um. I'll message you later. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah, and and about saving time. So yeah, we have some ideas about how we can like distill this information back into the language models. Yeah, I'm happy to discuss this more offline or after the talk. So. Okay, so uh, with that, I'll move on to the next part of the talk. So when we were developing rank gen, one of the things we noted was that evaluation is extremely challenging. So automatic metrics didn't exist until the release of MOV, which was towards the end of the project. And my collaborators and I personally spent like many weeks spending our Fridays reading outputs and judging them manually, like doing blind um, pairwise testing manually. So you may be wondering why we are doing that and why not use something like RuGel? <laughs> So we will now revisit our work in hurdles and discuss some broader issues with evaluation. So as you recollect, the primary metric that we used to claim state-of-the-art performance on ELI-5 was this metric called RuGel. So what is this metric and how does it work? So let's say we have a long-form question as well as its corresponding generation. And we assume we have access to a gold answer or a reference written by a human. To find RuGel, what we will do is we will check the token overlap between these two answers, which are highlighted in yellow here. And then we'll measure some kind of overlap statistic, such as F1 score or the longest common subsequence. And this is used to give us a root score between 0 and 100. So in this case, the root score between these two generations is 13.5. And even though this generation looks pretty good, this, this, this number looks a bit low. So we wanted to stress test and understand how reliable this metric actually is. And we designed some really simple lower and upper bounds to stress test RuGel. Our first lower bound is called input copying, where instead of having an actual answer, we simply copy the input, uh, input question statement multiple times. And while this answer is completely nonsensical, we still expect it to have some token overlap with the gold answer, because it's referring to words like boats and white. And maybe it can get some RuGel points. Our second lower bound is a random training set answer, uh, ra random answer from the training set. So while this is completely irrelevant to the question, we expect it to have some stylistic similarities with the gold answer. 
And finally, as an upper bound, we will compare the root score of one human written answer with another. So now, how do these lower bounds compare to some actual systems like RAG, BART, DPR, and our uh, and our routing transformer model? So quite surprisingly, these lower bounds are actually really good in terms of RUGEL. The lower bound of input question copying is outperforming both the RAG model and the BART TPR, even though both RAG and BART TPR were generating plausible looking answers, whereas input question copying was completely nonsensical. On the other hand, our gold upper bounds are falling short. So with the human written answer getting just 21.2 RUGEL. And this is actually lower than the RUGEL that our model got. So is our model outperforming the gold reference? And are we like at superhuman performance? We did a human evaluation to reveal, uh, to, to check whether this is actually true. And we found that they significantly preferred the gold answer nearly 77% of the times compared to our model. In summary, automatic evaluation for long form generation is very problematic and human evaluation continues to be the gold standard. But is human evaluation problem free? Unfortunately, human evaluation as well has a lot of challenges. For instance, Skarpinska et al. in 2021 found that humans don't like to read long text. To evaluate a 250 word generation, crowd workers would just take 10 seconds median and often spam the task. Whereas to do the task properly with English writers or teachers, this task would take almost 70 seconds median time. There are also issues of high variability from run to run, as well as low inter annotator agreement, as shown by some prior work. And these problems are only growing in importance. There's this large effort to collect human evaluation data sets, which are being used to align large language models with reinforcement learning with human feedback. So it's really important to have high quality human evaluation protocols. So what is current literature doing to address this? To better understand this, in our work, we conducted a comprehensive survey of 162 papers studying long form text generation. Overall, we found that human evaluation of long form text generation is rarely done. Only 73% papers, uh, sorry, 73% papers did not do any human evaluation. And even the 27 paper, percent papers who did human evaluation widely varied in their setups as well as metrics for evaluation. In other words, there's a big lack of standardization in prior work. A number of papers who did human evaluation did not follow many of the best practices suggested by Gehrman et al. in 2022. For instance, only 12 out of these 44 papers reported crucial statistics like inter annotator agreement. These findings motivated us to develop the long eval guidelines for better human evaluation of long form text summarization. And I'm happy to share that Long Eval recently received an outstanding paper award at ESEL 2023. So in our survey, we identified three issues with current eva human evaluation practices. One, there's poor inter-annotator agreement between different annotators. Second, the task can get quite expensive due to the long length of text. And third, the task can get quite co cognitively demanding because annotators don't not only have to read the, the original generation, but also the, the original source document or references when they're doing their, this fact, correct, uh, fact checking process. So in our work, we focus on evaluating the faithfulness of long form summarization. So given a question and its corresponding generation, we aim to measure how often this generation contained hallucinated facts. So make, to make things more manageable, we assume that in this in this setting, the question can be answered from a known source document. So this question is about the plot of the story Muckman, and we assume that we have access to the document Muckman while humans are doing this evaluation. This setting is also called query focused summarization in literature. So how can human evaluation measure how good this generation is? So the domin dominant protocol that we found in existing literature is something called coarse-grained evaluation. Here, the entire long generation is read at once, and a Likert scale score is provided to the entire generation, say from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 
a less frequently adopted protocol is something called fine grained annotation, where instead of annotating the entire text at once, a span of text, such as a clause or a sentence, is highlighted. And this is judged in the context of the rest of the generation. Scores over individual spans are then averaged to get an overall score for the summary. So which of these two protocols is better? We did a careful human, uh, human annotation study where we annotated the same set of summaries with both coarse and fine grain annotation. Overall, we noticed that fine grain annotation gave us much better inter-annotated agreement than coarse grain annotation. And it reduced the standard deviation of uh, between different annotators from 18.6 to 6.8. And this is very useful if we want to use a human evaluation for some downstream tasks. For instance, in this plot, we're using the human evaluations to measure how good our automatic evaluation metrics for summarization are. The y-axis shows a number of automatic evaluation metrics like rouge, part score, blurt, and so on. And the x-axis measures how good that metric is by comparing its correlation with human performance. We can see that fine grain annotation gives us much smaller error bars, indicating that we are much more confident about, uh, uh, about, about our estimates of quality using the same amount of, uh, of summaries. So this fine grain annotation is very good for agreement statistics, but it can get quite expensive. So while it may be quick to annotate one or two spans, this can quickly grow as we annotate the entire generation. And long generations with 270 words can easily have 30 to 40 units, which need to be annotated. So what if instead of annotating every single unit, we simply annotated a random subset of units in the generation? If the errors are uniformly distributed across the generation, we expect this to correlate highly with a, with a full annotation. We conducted a human annotation study comparing the correlation between a partial annotation, where only a random subset of spans are annotated, and a full annotation. And, I, and as shown in the plot here, the x-axis represents the fraction of units that were annotated, whereas the y-axis measures this actual correlation between a partial as well as a full annotation. We can see that after annotating 50% units, the Kendall Tower correlation is really high, nearly 0.85. And it continues to be high even when 20% units are annotated, reaching nearly 0.75 Kendall Tau. In other words, annotating just a random subset of spans is an effective way to save annotation costs. Now, finally, if you'll notice, in our discussion so far, we completely ignored the source document, which the, which the annotators need to read in order to check whether facts in the summary are correct or not. One thing you may wonder is that do annotators need to actually read this entire document? This can be quite long, nearly 5,000 tokens in length for this particular story. What if we could automatically highlight sentences in the source document, which are relevant to annotating a particular span? In our work, we benchmark several possible ways to, to, to do this alignment using methods like retrievers or semantic similarity systems. And overall, we found that this automatic alignment is useful when the generated span is quite extractive or copied verbatim from the source document. However, the best available aligners get just about 61% accuracy. And this is quite uh, problematic because an incorrect alignment can mislead annotators. So in summary, our overall guidelines are, one, to improve poor inter-annotator agreement, annotate short spans instead of, instead of annotating the entire long generation at once. Second, annotate a random fraction of units or spans in the entire generation in order to save annotation costs. And third, to make the task a bit less cog cognitively demanding for annotators, align generations with the source document. And this is most helpful in some cases like extractive units. We've also packaged long eval, just like RankGen, as a PIP package, which outputs the data in a format fully compatible with the with a mechanical Turk interface. And you can use this interface with any pool of annotators using the sandbox mode. Just run PIP install long eval and run our script to use the package. 
Okay, so um, yeah, uh, we're at 47. Okay, so let me discuss future work and then I'll pause at the end for the um, for the final set of questions. Okay, so uh, with that, I'll move on to the final part of the talk and I'll desc describe some future directions that I'm really excited about. So I'll start by describing my vision towards plan-based long-form text generation, and then I'll move on to secure long-form text generation. So in the last few months, uh, as you may have seen, retrieval augmented generation is getting extremely popular. There are many commercial tools that are being released, like Perplexity AI, and they're combining existing search engines with large language models. One question I have here is, do these models actually work on complex queries, such as how well connected are airports near Amherst to the United Kingdom? If you look at the output from one of the most popular such uh, services called Perplexity AI, we can see that the output looks good on a surface. However, if you carefully look at the output, there are lots of issues like contradictions and a lot of sentences which are completely irrelevant to the prompt. And overall, my hypothesis, looking at a lot number of these generations, is that these retrieval augmented models heavily rely on the direct presence of the same information on the internet, and they're less capable of doing sophisticated reasoning. Now, this is an even bigger problem if we move to some rarer entities or some tail distributions, uh, 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 tail distribution concepts. So in this case, if we, if we ask a question about South India and the Middle East, we can see that the entire answer is irrelevant to answering the question. And as we are training most of our models on US-centric data, which we do not even know what, what exactly the data is, without strong reasoning capabilities, I believe they will be unable to generalize well to tail distribution entities. My vision is that we should strive to build language models which generate plans rather than direct responses. For instance, here's how a plan-based model could go about answering this question. So step one, retrieve all the airports near Amherst. Step two, read the Wikipedia articles and filter all the airports which do not have international connectivity to the United Kingdom. Step three, Use some, some tool like flights to figure out what is the latest flight schedule. And fourth, a thing that many of the, uh, these current LLMs miss is understand the distance between Amherst and all these airports, which can significantly constrain one schedule. Finally, summarize all this information and generate the plan as well as the final answer. I believe that these plans should tightly be integrated with APIs as well as multimodal data to make the best of the available knowledge and tools that we have. Okay, so moving on, a second direction that I'm very excited about is secure long-form text generation. As I mentioned previously, there are a lot of emergent LLM issues related to misuse, security, and privacy. For instance, there's a growing worry that large language models will be used by students to cheat in college essays. There's also a growing privacy risk, especially related to what data is being fed to train these models, which we have no idea about, and whether this, this, whether this data can be produced verbatim when we generate long form text. There's also this issue of prompt injection attacks, where adversaries can write strategic prompts, which cause the language models to completely ignore previous instructions or write toxic and biased text, which is not supposed to. And this problem is even getting worse with data poisoning attacks that some people have introduced recently. One particular direction that I've recently looked at is plagiarism in college essays, where several algorithms have recently emerged to generate uh, to, to, to detect AI-generated text. Given a prompt and a generation, you pass it through a detector, which tells you if a language model wrote that text or not. One of the interesting questions here is that how robust these detectors are to paraphrasing, which use different words or sentences while still preserving the meaning. Since paraphrasing changes many of these words, the statistical properties of the original generation are lost. And, and you may wonder whether the detect detectors can still actually work. In our very recent preprint, we found that text detection can easily be, be evaded, often by large margins, as shown by the red arrows here. We also presented a defense using information retrieval which is much more robust to paraphrasing attacks. And just a few days back, I saw a tweet from the GPT-0 CEO, 
which is one of the most popular AI generated text detection services, that they'll actually be implementing our defense mechanism in their product. So before I finish, I just want to add a high level note about these two future directions. I believe that to fundamentally make progress towards these issues, we should strive to build these capabilities into large language models during pre-training or fine tuning, rather than relying on just clever prompt engineering. So some of the directions that I'm really excited about here are, can we intelligently select or create pre-training data to do this? How do the large language model scaling laws relate to these particular goals of planning and secure long-form text generation? Can we make better pre-training objectives to model long context, say 100K tokens, to better interact with long outputs that we may get from these APIs? And finally, how do we efficiently benchmark and evaluate these two aspects in, in long-form text generation? So with that, I come to an end. I want to thank all my excellent collaborators for projects in this talk, without whom none of this would have happened. And thank you so much for your attention. I would be happy to take any questions you may have. Uh, let's thank Kalpesh for the great talk. And uh, this would be a good time for questions. I'll take one on um, long about um, which uh, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about. Um, there is some work that um, seems to suggest that um, you could at least elicit uh, models to self-evaluate their output, um, like the thread of work of constitutional AI, the anthropic is pushing. Um, and you can imagine that this uh, evaluation uh, that um, protocol that you propose could also um, be integrated as, as part of a generative model. Um, I was wondering if you have any thoughts on the topic um, of using that protocol as a way for models to self-critique. Yeah, so I, I, I definitely think it's a very um, exciting step. And um, in some recent work, we had some, so this recent work, fact score, we, we have some um, results in this direction where one model is used to critique another model's outputs. But um, my, my general feeling is that like current models are good as like add-ons to human evaluation. I don't think they can completely re replace human evaluation. But at the same time, I think like these large language models, which are used to critique outputs, uh, they can be quite um, like they they can be quite effective in replacing our current set of automatic evaluation metrics. Like I think um, a, a lot of them may do a lot better than Rugel, and we can also like get fine-grained. Um, we can also use these large language models to get a fine grained understanding of why exactly a model is preferring one output or not, because it can generate an explanation. I think um, it's really important that we ensure in these cases that the large language models actually believe what they are generating. So like their, their preference and their explanation is aligned. And I think that's also an interesting um, open area with some exciting recent work. Yeah, I wasn't even thinking about automating evaluation more around your second line of just um, an additional way for, for alignment. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So about alignment, I think the, um, yeah, I, I definitely think it's a, it's a very promising direction. We did not test any large language model aligner. Uh, we just tested um, like the more like embedding based methods. And I think we did some bird based evaluations too, but nothing beyond bird. I think it's really exciting and given that large language models can like supposedly handle long context, uh, perhaps like the, even the long context thing is not a big issue and we can use them to do this automatic alignment well. Uh, one of the downsides with alignment is that if the span is wrong, so if the span on the summary or generation side is wrong, they will the large language models should be able to say that not, there's no matching span in the source document. And if, if it's a mistake there, then it can be a bit um, dangerous. So, so yeah, I, I think like if the la large language model is predicting there's no span, it has to be absolutely correct. Otherwise, the amount of errors can go quickly. Um, Akash, I had one question about your first project. So this motivating scenario around this like prefix suffix uh, task. Mm -hmm. I'm curious how I was trying to 
think about how this would work outside of a single long document, but in a scenario where you have a multi-docket scenario, which is still sort of a long input that the that the um, that the model has to process, but isn't necessarily like one single long document with like discourse properties that you need to preserve. I guess how would you do you know about work maybe from you or from others that have sort of devised these similar type of tasks but for multi-doc input scenarios? Um or does this not work may really make sense in a multi-doc context. So so um in terms of multi-doc you mean um do pre do prefix suffix identification where the negatives are coming from a different document? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I know of one work called, um, it's not like even there, I think it was from the same document though. Um, so, okay, so one thing that comes to my mind is the open AI embedding training method. So they sort of had an objective like this, but they use like different documents to, 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 to sample their negatives. And their goal there was to like make a very good embedding model. So, but, but I don't think they benchmark language model abilities to do this task there. I also think like uh, John Giorgi's work declutter had a similar objective, but even there, I think there was no benchmarking of whether LMs can do this task. And again, that was also for an embedding based method, uh, embedding based model. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I can't think of anything on the top of my head, but I'll, if I think, I'll, I'll definitely ping you. Oh, thank you. Um, one one small question, since we're on this slide. Um, on the next slide, you hypothesize that. Um, uh, yeah, this first hypothesis that they're just high likelihood in isolation. One way to test that would be um, to normalize by the probability of the generation yes. um, in the inequality on the previous slide. Yes. Did you try that? Does that work? Yeah, it it, it works. So, so um, um, yeah, I'm not sure if I added that slide in the presentation, but basically what happens is that it it covers about half of this gap by the, that division will cover half of the gap. But we found that we could not generate text with that. Uh, with that normalization, like it was doing, able able to do this task, but yeah, generation was tricky. So yeah, I think it was about seventy five percent here. So. Okay, thanks. Uh, cool. Well, since it's ten o'clock, let's thank Kalpesh one more time for a great talk. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, cool, and for the other one on ones that we have for you, Kalpesh. Thanks everyone for joining. Thank you. Bye. Bye.